Hello and welcome to Disconnect. And today we are talking about, uh, is it a little bit of a flashback, right? Not a flashback as much as a... Um, Memory bank. As a creation of a frame of reference, let's call it, right? A lot of people ask us, what should we buy? And we do a lot of processing before we come to those conclusions. Mm. And today, I think we can try and summarize those conclusions by talking about the milestones that we've seen along the way. Vehicles that we may or may not recommend today, but they definitely change the way we think about a certain category of vehicles and what they might do in your lives. So what we talk about when we are comparing vehicles and often talking about vehicles is what I call as a universe of reference points. And so often, every so often, and when it happens, it's beautiful because you'll get a vehicle that shows you something that you thought wasn't possible or you had not experienced before. And when that happens, it becomes your benchmark, it becomes a moment and you remember it. That's right. So oldest benchmark that you remember reference point uh, the shogun all right so i started reading about the shogun before i became a journalist and mm. neville daruhanawala wrote an article for car and bike international mm. which was a very well written article it had mm. his girlfriend susan playing a part of a, a recommender and a reiterator as it were in the mm. article it was a really powerful article that basically said you must have this bike right and I was not a tester at that point of time. But when we started riding RD350s, the most annoying people would be on Shoguns because uh -huh. RD350s would not escape Shoguns. The Shoguns wouldn't pass the RD350, but you couldn't escape a Shogun rider being behind you. So to me, the earliest benchmark I have for what a performance, realistically affordable motorcycle hmm. would be was a Shogun. It was what I thought would be my first ever motorcycle, but my salary wouldn't cover it. So I got a KB125. Right. But in my heart, there's always going to be a Shogun-sized hole. And if you were back in the day and I was a journalist, I'd totally be recommending Shoguns to everyone. So was it the outright performance yeah, of... Or basically. That, that, that that's was it. it. I, I overlooked the pink stripes. Right. I didn't look at how it looked. Uh, right. I think the ads, like the chicken truck ad, yeah. I thought, yeah. yes, this is it. Yeah. This is what I want because it was a tremendous ad. And I just remember it was so blacked out, it was cool. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if I had a Shogun, it'd probably be all blacked out with all the stickers removed. But uh, that to me was my first benchmark saying... This is how it should be. All know? right. So for me, uh, there's one experience I remember when I just joined this line. So back when I was with Car India, Bike India, with Adil, I was doing a comparison test. There was a Chevy Avio and there was the Ford Fiesta, hmm. right? And they were on paper so similar, hmm. right? But you got into the Fiesta and you drove it and you were just excited by it. And you were like, this is 100% faster. Mm. This is 100% faster, mm. right? And then we, of course, us, we boxed it and we got the numbers. And it turned out that they were not that far apart in terms of performance. Yeah. And so I went back to the cars and I drove them again. And I was like, why does it feel so different? Right. And that is what Ford used to get so right. Mm. It was the nature of the vehicle in terms of what you could hear. Mm. You could hear a little bit of the intake sound. It would just feel a little bit more responsive when you went on the throttle. It's not that the outright performance was that different, but how immediate and how connected it let you feel yeah. was so important. So that made me realize that performance is one thing, but the sense of performance mm. is so important for you to enjoy. Yeah. So for cars, that would be one of my first memories of a real learning from testing. Let's switch it back to today. So today at the bottom of the market, cars, motorcycles, scooters, I don't care. What would be your benchmark vehicles that you think change something fundamentally about how you approach the idea of a basic vehicle? For uh, like you're talking budget. Yeah. So for me in uh, two wheelers, mm. it's the Axis. Mm. The Not the Activa. The Access. Mm. The Activa is fantastic. No, I mean, no, it's, it's not. A, I don't think it is. No, I mean, it is a tool, right? It's a it's a great tool. It's proved itself. But Access to me showed how you could take that tool aspect of it and make it just great. If it I, didn't have to be basic. The distance is too much. I'd like to high five you here. <laughs> 
because they went to 125 hmm. they were the first ones to go to 125 right yeah. if i'm not yeah they, they were, were the first, first ones to go to 125 yeah. they i mean you rode an access and you got the sense that hey the suspension is good even with a pillion on board and you access the level of enjoyment on a scooter that i, I don't like think how the you Activa, that in. <laughs> uh, ever uh, allowed you to access as it were right because the Activa was a lot of things and yeah. when it came out, the refinement was mind-blowing, the Absolutely. way the quality was created and I don't think it's as, we don't have that same high quality perception about the Activa anymore. No. But it changed some benchmarks yeah. and you were like, okay, Honda made a seriously good scooter, right? But then the Access comes out and you're like, it's a really good scooter, yeah. but it's fun to ride and that to me changed everything. So I remember we had a long-term Access in the office, a black one. Right. And there was almost a fight over the keys all the time going on with the access. Right. That was not the case with the Activa. The Activa mm. was a very convenient tool, as you said. Mm. But the access had something extra special emotionally. And that made that bike yeah. really special. Even today, we recommend accesses in Bergmans regularly, where we have to basically explain to the guy asking that the Bergman is a different way to style the access. But fundamentally, the nature of the scooter They're is the not same. different. Yeah. yeah. Motorcycles? Motorcycles. Budget. Hmm? Oh, wait, there was one right at the start. And that brand is no more. The LML, what was it? Adreno Energy? No, no, the 100cc, yeah. Oh, oh that had Freedom. CRD 100, was that it? Oh, that was right at the end of the LML yes, ad adventure. Yes, yes, yeah, that, yeah. that 100cc. Hmm. Like, I'm not kidding you. That bike, I had right after that... This was again at Car India. So this was really at the end of LML Strength. This was after the Adrenos was, and everything. I'm telling you, it was so at the end that we failed to return it. Oh, really? Our long-termer came literally in the last days of LML. It didn't get registered, so it got parked. And by the time we realized that it was parked and unregistered to return it, there was no organization left to talk to. Hmm. So I think a dealer finally came and collected it from us, and I'm not sure that was legit. Oh, Interesting. Hmm. So this was right at when Car India Bike India was starting. So we were in the early days. There were no, test bikes used to come in. There were no long termers, etc. So Adil was saying that you know you'll get a long term. Hang on. And one day he says, okay, this is your long term. I'm like, no man, I want something bigger. I want something more powerful. And um, he said, no, no, you start. And I used to live the furthest. Hmm. So I said, okay, fine, whatever. And I grew to love that bike. Hmm. I mean, a hundred cc. It was. It was so polished in terms of suspension. Yeah. It was great to ride. The mm. engine characteristic, it wasn't dull. It wasn't that it was just, you know, one mode of riding only. Yeah. A 100cc that had versatility on it out of the box. And the suspension, I cannot forget because after that, I got the Unicorn, which I consider a huge benchmark. Mm. And the Unicorn came and still today mm. in terms of chassis, mm. I think is a huge benchmark. Yeah. And I looked back at the CRD saying that, yes, the Unicorn is better, mm. but that little motorcycle yeah. in fact, was doing a I would add to job. that. I would say LML never got enough credit for the quality of motorcycles that they were able to build. Okay. There was a freedom. Yeah. Uh, when the 125 came out, I think it started to go downhill. Mm. So I would ignore the freedom 125, the Graptor, Beamer and all of this. Right. Adreno, Energy, great frames. Yeah, they were the basically frame. overbuilt. There was too much Correct. frame and not they enough engine. perimeter frames, right? Uh, Graptor had the perimeter frame. Uh -huh. I don't think the energy and the uh, uh, energy didn't. Did Graptor have. had the uh, Graptor perimeter had. frame. But the uh, and the Freedom One Ten to me was epic. Oh, it yeah. was ugly as the word that you're thinking of, and it went so well. The engine worked so well. The frame worked so well. It was so hard to scrape anything because the ground clearance and the cornering clearance were both so high. It was ugly. Yeah. But I remember meeting somebody, uh, we were, I came in for first service and my bike was 17,000 kilometers in because I basically never stopped riding it. Mm -hmm. And I was commuting Thani to Worli at that point of time. So it was a oh, 70 wow. kilometer day. Oh, wow. So it racked up the miles really. And I never noticed any drop in performance. So why would you service it? And at some point I said, yeah, just as a thank you to the bike, I should service <laughs> it. There was a guy there doing his first service at 21,000 kilometers. Wow. And he was a small trader who would basically go with something to a town, sell it off, buy something there, go to the next town and sell it. So he was basically putting miles on the freedom. And he said, it's taken me 21,000 kilometers to return to Mumbai. So I'm doing service. Oh, wow. So my second service is probably going to be at 45,000 kilometers or something mm. like that. And mm. the bike had been flawless. Uh. 
and that was my experience too that the bike was flawless i don't think they ever 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 got enough mm. credit for what they managed to pull off with the freedom agreed today today's benchmark so you're saying access for the scooters <clears throat> today's 100 cc 125 cc class benchmark for you would be what 125 cc i've had a very popular i mean very i mean it's long standing for me it's been the shine yeah i think so the shine has i mean i think when they started off there were a couple of things that were few rough edges hmm. gearing i think was one of the yeah. biggest challenges in the early days yeah hmm. the gearing just let you sit i mean you ended up sitting in what would probably be the engine's least smooth spot hmm. whereas just a few hundred rpm away was yeah. the sweet spot yeah so that was it but other than that i think 125 easily when i think about recommending to somebody now you have the shine the shine sp um super picks hmm. and because again great to ride versatility solidity all of that nailed hmm. and for me suspension plays a big part and i thought that was a well rounded motorcycle do you think the shine in the name is a noun or a verb oh my god how do you even think of all these things man this is what it is <laughs> Mm. So do you think the rider shines when he buys one or do you think the bike sh- <laughs> now now bike is a shiny bike now now <clears throat> now no now no <laughs> it's such a strange name for a bike right <laughs> but it's a good bike so let's mm. get on with it mm. cars cars it took me a long time to appreciate it mm. the alto yeah yeah is the envy of the mountain mountain guys right you go in a fortune you go in a thar you get overtaken by altos everywhere I mean just what all it can do hmm. how easily and do it again while being frugal practical everything hmm. I think that appreciation for that car has only come with time it was hmm. easy to look down upon it as a Are there other cars in the segment that are unlocking that ability now you think it's something specific to the Maruti Alto that happened No I think the Quid also is a great car hmm. but what the Alto wins people over with is that sense of reliability the bulletproofness mm. right that it's going to keep going right i think that aspect is nailed down pat and the current one has car plate yeah at no, what 4 lakh rupees 5 <laughs> lakh rupees <laughs> no no it's at 6 lakh rupees 6 6 lakh rupees the yeah, alto is now yeah yeah how expensive so that would be in small cars that is one really small but one clear benchmark shit man sorry this mm. is ford again <laughs> figo the first gen yeah it was a good car I agree. It was a fantastic car. Mm. I mean, it it literally changed expectations mm. because you got a car that was spacious, you got a car that w- that drove well, you got a car that was priced well, you had a car that it, back then the diesel engine was the that engine was everything you wanted it mm. to be. On paper, not not so powerful, 67 horsepower. So how like did that. Ford die? because you already i mean in the first what 10 minutes of this you've already brought a ford twice and ford has come up in a conversation a lot uh, yeah, so a company time. that's done obviously amazing work yeah. how does a company like that just die out to the point where they can't figure out how to run a business here what happened the thing is reputation in one sentence yeah we are we are not very forgiving hmm. oh yeah. not forgiving at all so if if we make a mistake it's hard to fix that and i think ford's reputation with the escort when it came in and the icon don't forget and yeah the icon when those cars those cars set a reputation for ford as mm. being expensive to own it was uh, and difficult to maintain it was and that was the end of it and it was a premium brand right when it came in the mm. escort was a big deal and that just stuck i mean till the end ford's biggest play was trying to convince people that fords are not expensive to maintain yes yeah, true it was true it and took them that long and i think they were getting there no and they put the a lot of effort of it. into it too to give credit yeah. where it's due yeah. but i think they cooked that goose very early on by not understanding where india was mm-hmm. at and trying to be ford and jumping uh, from this i'll jump to skoda hmm. the original octavia no oh, what a great car my right? god hmm. and that thing's diesel engine hmm. that sense of build quality what build quality really means solid mm. build quality amazing i think the octavia was a benchmark for that as to what a european car 
could mean do you think in time they've overcome their reputation for having absolutely terrible and dishonest service that's exactly why i jumped to the octavia because they went through that really bad patch right mm. with whatever happened with one of the dealers so it's not one of the dealers it was many of them no many of them but there was that one case that blew up on team bhp uh, yeah, yeah. yeah see the the thing that i understand about that phase of skoda is that they were in an expansion mode with so much gusto that the verification of whether these dealer partners and service partners should be in the network and do they morally and qualitatively fit into the picture was not evaluated very well i think in fact there's a darker side to it also where mm. it suggested that it even was brazen mm. not just an oversight aspect okay uh so that was it because it was chronic mm. it wasn't a one off yeah. right yeah. Uh, that one case blew it up but there was a lot of issues back then mm. but since then they have i mean it's been a long way since then and today mm. if you look at what they're promising in terms of service the kind of warranties they're offering they are working i mean they've done a lot to change that it does the question still persist yes it does of course does it stop people from buying skodas today i don't think so hmm. i don't think that happens people think about it maybe once hmm. but that's it they're almost over the hump yeah they're all yeah exactly they're almost past that now hmm. and credit to them they have gone out of the way yeah and in the same breath as as much as i understand that the staff has changed and there are new people dealing with the challenges that the old people left behind they weeded out dealers yeah. they weeded out dealers yeah that's what i said so they have new people who are dealing with mm-hmm. the legacy of people who aren't there anymore in that sense right. but those people really really did mess up things for a brand yeah. on the long run and i think this is a problem we've talked about privately before mm-hmm. where a lot of people will arrive in an organization and they will harm the organization in long run to show benefit mm-hmm. short term for their own right uh, resumes yeah. don't have people like that Hmm. they don't do good things for you um okay who are you looking at over there are you looking at somebody i know that there are manufacturers watching and i know that they know who i'm talking about as soon as i say these things huh. so i'm looking at you here's looking at you kid um to me the other benchmark that arrived very early on in my career was the uh, pulsar 150 uh, more the pulsar 180 uh, today's pulsar i just I'm, bought a cvz before that yeah <laughs> i know i know the feeling right No, I'm not even going to bring up the current pulses because I don't think in terms of what they represent, they represent anything close to that anymore. Uh, I have issues about it, which I made a video about. I'll try and leave a link. But I think those pulses showed us that not only could you make enthusiastic motorcycles at reasonable prices, but yeah. you could make people feel things with small motorcycles, yeah. and that that world would be a more attractive world to live in. And it opened that door. And Bajaj at that point would do an annual update to that bike. and they were a minor update one year and there'd be a slightly more significant update the other year then they changed the styling and it kept that interest going and i think bajaj lost that plot because they got busy with ktm and the other stuff and i don't think that this triumph think is going to really make their job easier i'm not going, i'm not saying they'll do a terrible job of it but i'm saying they'll get busier and busier and busier and that means either r&d has to expand at that scale so that all projects get justice or you'll have these silences on certain brands then it'll suddenly wake up and do something so you're saying that ktm and triumph are kind of uh, putting bajaj products on See, the back burner if you look at the guy who heads r&d today he will now have to manage three separate brands which will have multiple projects underneath it because you're not building a bike for e- any of these three things bajaj has its own line and the exports don't match the imports uh, the indian domestic then there will be ktms which has the in, luckily for bajaj a unified line it's not like the exports are different mm. regulations aside and now triumph will come and they'll have the same challenge right on the other side the showroom challenge is the same because the triumph dealership network will also be taken over by bajaj so bajaj's plate is becoming more and more full but is bajaj's plate expanding at the same rate they're also working on chetak and chetak is now a brand which means there'll be one chetak unit which is being sold today and there'll be more chetak it's a lot of activity being expanded hmm. but do you hear enough about bajaj opening up their human resources and facilities at the scale that all of these projects will require i think there is a gap but bajaj will catch up to that gap but in the gap they will have the same silence that the pulsar had right hmm. think about the time when in 2009 the classic 350 came from royal enfield and it made royal enfield the big company that it is today that's the time when bajaj was silent hmm what were they up to hmm it's not like they forgot the pulsar they were busy with setting up ktm, KTM. and the other things and all of that and that took so much of their attention that they didn't focus on their own product hmm. the basic resource crunch hmm. so the pulsar is a benchmark for me um in the small cars i think the zen was a bit of a benchmark for me because it, it showed that you could have a 
hatchback where the primary conversation was an economy and space right the primary conversation was wow i really enjoy driving this car right. and i think maruti lost a little bit of the spark as it were by not having a car like that in their lineup today they ruined the zen for me with the zen estelo i the zen estelo was just terrible i hated that thing it was terrible to drive it destroyed what zen meant for me yeah and i and you're right the first zen was beautiful i mean to look at to drive and today i think what i miss from maruti is that sense of excitement right mm. because okay the alto can be driven very enthusiastically and it responds mm. i get it mm. but wagonar it's a workhorse mm. and i'm not saying they're bad cars mm. it's a workhorse celerio mm. workhorse i see the more as taxis or anything else anymore but okay workhorse mm. espresso i don't think it's very good looking but uh. it's a workhorse if everything is a workhorse what is maruti talking to the enthusiast with at the swift isn't that a little too high up is it shouldn't there be something below it but the zen i think the zen would sit pretty much where the swift is today hmm. in terms of what the structures were then if you just move forward what is forward, the starting price of a swift swift would be about 5 that's your base model yeah and your alto five is sitting at half, you yeah. said 6 six. 6ish six top end yeah so today if, today if you look at the top end swift hmm. you're going to be nudging 10 lakhs hmm. right Nine, whatever X showroom would be. In I that. think the case that you made in the previous podcast for the Swift RS, uh, the Sport or whatever it's called, mm. I think now is the time to do it. Yeah. So the Swift was is now the current gen Swift is a great example again for me as to how the same platform mm. lives in three different states, right? Mm. You have the Ignis on one side, mm. which is an all rounder. Yeah. Right. it's got high ground clearance and all that so versatility mm. and on the side you've got baleno mm. which is a great family car mm. no again neither i mean the ignis is fun in some ways the baleno is all right yeah but at the same time you've got the swift in the middle mm. which is which is clearly a family car but it has this hidden streak in it yeah. about being fun to drive mm. how did that happen was it intentional was it not i keep wondering about that mm. because you look at the organization that is maruti and suzuki and you look at everything that they're doing which is so i don't want to call it functional but it is mobility as a service or as as a purpose tool. yeah as a tool you know yeah. so in that suddenly you find this streak of excitement and fun and you're like Hmm. I agree. This this is this is pretty cool. Okay, so what what's a what would be a fun car benchmark at a reasonable price outside of the Swift for you, or has there been one along the years? So we've talked about Zen and Swift, so we're not bring those up. Something else. Figo was for me. Hmm. I'm gonna drop that. It's a dead as, car. Uh, yeah. Next. Fun upwards of I mean under ten lakhs. Something an enthusiast might reasonably be able to afford, even if they're not in middle so management. So Tata done the JTPs. What JTPs? Who saw those JTPs? Yeah, that's After the, the three people point. who bought it, where the hell did the JTP go? That is the sad part of it. They took because Tata I mean, to me, JTP stands for just time pass. Because literally, that's what happened. <laughs> you got to make people cry, man, with that one. But it's true. The guys who have the JTPs know how good the cars were, and I'm not knocking the engineering or the intention. But follow it up, man. I- imagine they brought it out, and everybody went like. you know like this is great this is what was needed and you know people were excited because it's tata you know it'll be accessible all of that and the next thing just time pass the time passed that was the sad part of it i mean honestly in in retrospect it's just stupid they should have followed through on that project and i know that there would be people who would be very happy with those vehicles because it made the right sound and today it, think about the tatas today right yeah they're higher higher quality than we've ever seen them before we know that both mahindra and tata still have a lot of long term niggles to sort out where mm. there are small annoyances in mm. their cars but the big problems are solved mm. now is the time to do jtps right a, a faster harrier a faster safari a faster tiago those names the tiago yeah. tigor or whatever Now is the time to do faster cars. Altros is Altros Racer. The JTP name is gone, but Altros Racer is in the works. I hope <laughs> that it happens, and this time they really push Stick it. Stick with it. Yeah. yeah, most importantly. Okay, but else? there is a market for that. Benchmarks. Benchmarks. Uh, family car. Three bucks. And you can't say desire because we know the desire is an mm. awesome car. Yeah. No. No. Actually, I was going to talk about City. Hmm. And City is a great example. Uh, it. it shows you the beauty of honda hmm. when they you know they have that phrase man maximum machine minimum hmm. it sounds like yeah whatever hmm. but 
they have always managed to offer you so much space mm. on the inside with just clever design and engineering yeah. and i remember when the city first came to india and it was like that cool looking one and then they went to the next generation which was the dolphin the zx yeah yeah the <laughs> zx came was the second iteration of that mm. right first it was yeah, it was always called dolphin uh, it was a shock like you couldn't compute but when you got in the car and you started living with it you were like man this makes so and they went to the 77 ps engine you remember yep. the idea's i first when, twin spark yeah. engine and you were like what the hell no, is no, this no no first nonsense? twin spark was bajaj bro oh the oh yeah that yeah the pulses came before correct you remember the ditsi pulses or uh, dti <laughs> pulses sorry not ditsi so the city also used to i mean that uh, used no, to in fact have, i think city said benchmarks multiple times right because when the first cities came out for coolness oh my god what great yeah. cars they were to drive Yeah. Right. I mean, the Mitsubishi Lancer came out very shortly afterwards, and I had test rides on both the car test rides on both the cars, and the city was just like a mile ahead in terms of how impressive and orally and driving wise the experience was. Although the Lancer was such a legendary car, right? Yeah. Uh, before the VTEC also, just the 1.3 and the 1.5. Like when I drove the 1.5s the first time, I was like, "Wow, this is impressive." So I was expecting to be disappointed by the 1.3. But the long term we had in the office was this Cherry Maroon 1.3, and it was beautiful to drive. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I loved those cars, and I went through the transition of this Dolphin arriving, and everybody's like, "What the hell is that?" Right? Yeah. And I do think that Honda could have had those cars coexist, and you'd have two different markets for it, like they do now, for the fifth and the fourth gen. Yeah. yeah. I, I, sometimes manufacturers take whatever fifteen, twenty years to see the light. It's okay. But yeah, Hondas have always been nice cars. And uh, the city V Tech. Hmm. Okay. It was such a big draw. I remember one of my friends had it, and uh, he had to go drop. He had some uh, people traveling from for business from Korea, so he had to drop them back to the airport, which was to Bombay. Hmm. And he's like, uh, "Will you give me company? To I have to go to the airport." And I'm like, "Yeah, you know, who wants to drive to Bombay in the middle of the night? Come back at 5 a.m. just to go to the airport." And like, I said, uh, I was doing. Uh, uh, he said, "I'm taking the city, and you can drive on the way back." I was sure, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this is when the expressway was new, right? There's barely any traffic, nothing. Yeah. And man, I'm so glad there were no speed limits. And uh, I mean, oh, anyways, uh, the point is that thing was redlined. Yeah, no, and they oh. they were such such nice cars because you could drive a 1.3. Uh, I've done the express for quite a bit on that car in those days and the 1.3 yeah and uh-huh. it would return amazing economy despite you sitting at steady 90 steady 100 yeah. through the whole of the express way it was brilliant correct do i have the same feeling about the honda city since then hmm. almost never no they brought back the feeling uh, i mean no i think i think of them as fantastic city uh, city uh-huh. and family cars today do i think of a car that i would want to drive enthusiastically ah uh-huh. no no The, 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 that's the interesting thing there was a magic attached to the city right which went to honda which is why we looked up to honda so much and now with the current generation city they've brought it back to some extent hmm. where they're still lagging is with an exciting powertrain an exciting engine they've got the hybrid now which technologically again shows you what honda's capable of and sure. how great it is and it's it's good in terms of performance but does it connect like we saw even with the hybrid system in the grand vitara when you really want to drive hard and you want that connection of the throttle and the mm. wheels it's not it's not there you know if you look at what's going on on that table there we've got two europeans and one <laughs> japanese in there and i think that's sort of emblematic of where the japanese are at today because mm. if you think about it for the last 10 years especially in india we haven't had a japanese machine arrive and blow us away we've regularly had european stuff arrive and blow us away we even had korean stuff arrive and blow us away but like a japanese product that said holy mother of god this is amazing where is it no think about it bikes and cars both exactly super bikes think about it there was a time if you thought super bike high performance track machines you said straight fire blade it was done it was fireblade it was r1 it was ninja this is all people spoke about this is all you thought of yeah you thought red green blue that was that was it yeah it was nothing else hmm. but today i i remember i used to i i remember the first time i rode the fireblade hmm. and i was just like wow i'm riding a fireblade hmm. there's a big event think about the fireblade today yeah I don't even think about it. Like you'll be thinking Panigale, hmm. I'll be thinking Aprilia, I'll be thinking um, uh, BMW S1000R. Hmm. 
because the Europeans have just made strides and the Japanese have not quite kept up. Oh, there is a joke in there that I cannot make because it is just so wrong on so many levels. Go for it. We can no, bleep it. No, 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 no. Come no. on, Shubhi. I, I'm no, saying do it. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is the first. He's not indulging, which means it goes. It, it's Yeah, it's, uh, it's bad. It's okay, bad. fine, fine. No, but to me, for example, the performance motorcycle benchmark in India hmm. could have easily been set by the Japanese who have a world's worth of products which do performance so well. Honda can't seem to get their pricing right. Hmm. Kawasaki can't seem to get their service right. Suzuki can't seem to get their marketing and sales push right. Hmm. So what did it take? It took a KTM. Right. And the 390 changed everything. I'm glad you said 390. Yeah. To me, the 390 Duke specifically 2013, yeah. 14. Because I know you own both the 200 and the 390. Yeah. To me, it was, this yeah. the 200 was a door that opened slightly yeah. and said, it's like a game trailer. Hmm. Right? It's very nice. Yeah. And then when you get into the game, then you really see what it's up to, right? And the 390 was all game. Yeah. It had, very, it, it basically said practicality. Hmm. Buy a car, man. You want to live, you get a 390 Duke, right? It was a very powerful statement to make. So the suspension, it was, Group. we wouldn't recommend it to anyone for that suspension. The seats, I mean, I know that the seats are awesome, but it took 8,000 kilometers of riding or something to figure out that the seats hmm. are awesome. And what was the refinement level of that engine? I mean, the first one, I remember dropping it on the very first test ride because the damn thing would just stall. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was the level of engineering that they, in theory, that finished. That engine shunt used to be so much at low speeds. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the amount of engine braking that thing used to produce. Mm. I mean, I use it today as a tool because I've ridden so long on it. But mm. you close the throttle and it basically shut itself off, more or less. Huh. It was not a great product or should not have been a great product. But the way it went... Those tires, the way it cornered, the way the brakes worked, although they've improved thankfully significantly over the time, yeah. the way it made you feel. I remember thinking, this is like the RD350 from back in the day. Hmm. I mean, the global reputation of the RD350 comes from being cheap, hmm. being reasonably reliable, not utterly reliable, and being very fast for the money. Hmm. And in 2013, that's what the Duke did for us. Hmm. They said, yeah, you can have 45 BHP. Yes, for just for 2 lakh rupees. Yes, it won't be the most refined, most mature thing you'll ever buy. Hmm. But man, as tools go, you know, it was the cheap sharp knife in your drawer that you always reach for subliminally, even though you've got more expensive or worse tools. It was just that thing. And even today, if you had awards of the year, consider the idea that when they started manufacturing is less critical than what's on the market today. That's the best way? To me, yes. This, and It's not the right way for most people giving away awards because you're not willing to invest in an old product as a company to promote it. So your award achieves only the one result, which is to recognize achievement. But So like in Europe and all, there are several awards which don't look at what is the late... I mean, the latest are of course considered, but um, the category is looked at as an overall picture, not just what was launched in the last year. Yeah. So if you as a buyer are looking at something, the award represents what you should be choosing. From the entire, at the entire pool. Yeah. Yeah. So, but we won't, won't go into the awards. I'm just saying the point I'm making is if the awards considered everything that was on sale today rather than what was on put on sale this year, mm. that 390 would be like an 1820 time winner of everything. Because it's only now that the prices have become to the point where VFM, uh, which is a big category in all of this, is going to not stand in the KTM's mm. favor. Mm. For the first five, eight years, that thing was VFM as heck. Mm. Two, two and a half lakh rupees, 45 BHP, that level of capability and the generations have only made that bike more and more mature. Mm. It's really hard to beat. Absolutely. And now that you've spoken about sharp and like a knife, mm. something's missing from this conversation. Hmm. Bring it. R15. What a, what a tremendous machine. Man. It's still, to me, from ge generation 1, 2, 3, it is still the benchmark for oh. a sports bike God. for the masses. Not the KTM RCs. That, like, the current RC is amazing, I think. But the R15 is, to me, the benchmark. And you can recommend it with your eyes closed to anybody. And it it's utterly, utterly reliable. Hmm. Utterly reliable. The stuff people do on an R15 yeah. is incredible. Yeah. And you hardly ever hear about... I have no, Actually, if I think about it, I've not heard about anybody saying that this thing was a poor experience because no. it was not reliable, something broke no. down, something didn't work as expected. Nothing. Yeah, there was a delusional phase at Yamaha where they were actually holding R15 sales back 
hmm. because they wanted their scooter sales to go up. Oh. Yeah, and in fact, the Raze ER I think was a benchmark for scooters in the sense of it handled so well. Hmm. Not the ZR actually. Why did I say the ZR? The basic Ray, the Ray. first Ray. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing scooter. Yeah. And now Yamaha scooters just basically look weird to me. Yeah. And I think if the Aerox suspension was fixed, it would be a much bigger benchmark than it is. Mm. But I don't think of it mm. too much. Mm. To me, the Entox set the scooter benchmark for sporty scooters. And I think that's still unbelievable. Yeah. I think right after BS6, they had a dip where it got a little boring. Correct. And, I don't and think then they've done, gone past And they've gone that. back. Yeah. And now I think the Ntok again is a phenomenal yeah. scooter to own. Ntok is a benchmark again. Yeah, 100%. Okay. Uh, mid-displacement. 650s. Oh, Vstrom 650. There's no doubt about it. There's no other machine like that. Okay. I All the Kawasaki's, they're okay. They're a little dull to ride. Service mm. is very expensive. Hmm. Versus 17-inch wheels, it can't really do off-road. Hmm. You ride a Vstrom 650, you immediately see why you pay an, a lakh extra over a Versus for it. Hmm. Because it does the road at least as well as a Versus, if not better. Hmm. The Versus seems to have more sophisticated suspension, but the Suzuki is close enough. Hmm. And when you go off-road, it has genuine ability. Hmm. And it has the spoke wheels you need to go off-road, but they're tubeless hmm. already. Hmm. They've literally got every one of those boxes checked. Hmm. I've ridden it at a racetrack and I've been phenomenal. I mean, hmm. That bike is just epic. In fact... I am worried about the parallel twin V-Strom. I oh, hope yeah. that they get all of these qualities right. I okay. think the V-Twin was part of the experience and I hope that Suzuki is able to hmm. keep the experience going. I wish Suzuki would push their bikes a lot more hmm. so that you'd see more of them. What do you mean push? Visibility, basic visibility. As in sell more in India or sell just more promote in India, them more? Promote them a little bit more. Hmm. Push, push them harder. Hmm. You know, there, there is the gap between I have a great product and look at me, I have a great product. You can hmm. do overdo it. Hmm. But... I think some amount of hygiene level, I don't think even Suzuki does that very well. Right. So I think they would really... It seems to fit in with who Suzuki is. Yeah, but look at, <laughs> look at their product lines, right? Uh, the Jixxer yeah. R1000 was a great sports bike. Didn't didn't sell because they didn't push it. The V-Strom 650 is a great bike. It sells quietly in its own quiet numbers, but nobody really knows. The Hayabusa, yeah. thankfully, because of Doom, it really Legendary promoted that status. bike, so it does yeah. so well. Yeah. But yeah. without Doom, would the Hayabusa sell in those numbers? Mm. I don't think so. Mm. They have a great scooter in the Access, but how much chatter do you hear about it? They right. have a great scooter in the Bergman, but how much chatter do you hear about that? Mm. The Avenis, it's arrived and almost disappeared. Mm. They had the Let's, which was a great scooter too, to ride, disappeared. They had the Swish. Okay, the we green. stop. Because those names will boggle my brain. Yeah. We'll get to Hayate and whatnot. Okay. Um... Practical two-wheelers, hmm. not scooters, hmm. which impressed. What kind of budget are you looking for, sir? Under, uh, let's say, a lakh, lakh and a half. Chala. So a budget practical two-wheeler that is easy to recommend to people. Shine. Shine SP would be easy. They're all, what, 70, 80,000 rupees now, I think. So you remember, like, riding the Shine and thinking this is a special? Yeah, the other Honda that was impressive was the Twister. Hmm. But I think it was way too early for its yeah. own time. It was, it was so much fun. Yeah, it I was know. so so good looking and all of those things. Mm. But I think it was too early. Today a twister I think might do better because the ambition has changed a little bit and the mm. appeal of what a basic bike needs to be has mm. split up. Mm. Everybody's just not in the splendor zone anymore. So today mm. I think the twister would do well. So for me, one, and uh, I've owned it now for I don't know how many years, Impulse. Mm. That, I was not an off-road rider. And that's something I will connect from the impulse to the Duke. Is that they made you comfortable with a genre mm. of motorcycling. Yeah. Right? I never thought of myself. I'd never ridden off-road. I'd done a little bit here and there, but nothing proper. Mm. But the first test ride, which was at Heroes, that uh, little uh, test facility or mm. whatever. So it was a at tarmac. At the good plant. Uh, at the tarmac. Uh, I mean, oval basically. You remember after I broke my shoulder, that was my first test ride. That impulse. Oh yeah, thing. correct. You remember when I took off my jacket, correct, everybody correct, looking correct. in horror because it was like a mass of crepe yeah, bandages. Yeah, correct, correct, correct. Now I remember. Yeah. They had a little shed and yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Correct. So between the oval in the middle of it was that overgrown gnarly patch yeah. where you couldn't see what was underneath because it was all grassy. Yeah, and I couldn't go there because of the shoulder, I remember. And I, for the first time in my life, went off-roading, hmm. right? And I realized that how easy it was on the impulse hmm. I just went on doing it. Mm. 
it was the first time i popped a wheelie on camera also i remember and it was just because the motorcycle let you feel at ease doing whatever you were doing and then i ended up buying it and i ended up doing a lot more off road because it let it, it let you and it encouraged you it encouraged you yeah. which is what i think in fact i think the impulse mistake that hero and honda made at that point of time together is that they downgraded the impulse package for india but only on the engine side hmm. so every time i ride an impulse i keep feeling like like i had a long term for a while hmm. in bombay hmm. uh, riding up and down from office or whatever i kept feeling like i'm maxing out the engine a lot before the chassis comes anywhere close hmm. to the limit of its hmm. ability and it's happened to certain generations of the r15 also where that balance of the chassis and the engine is not right hmm. and it always leaves me with a sense of sense of disappointment hmm. it's it's like oh they were not close enough to each other right and a balanced bike i think is what creates the most powerful feeling which is why the v1 r15 is such a powerful feeling which is why right. the first generation dukes are such a powerful feeling because that balance between frame and engine was which is why the 200 and the 250 duke don't feel as good as the 390 because the chassis has more capability than the engine can unlock So with the impulse, I've heard this a lot, and people find it. But think dumb. about it, right? Everybody who put the charisma engines back into their mm. impulses mm. found a much nicer motorcycle. Mm. But why? Mm. Because you were loading the suspension up more, you were loading the frame up more, and you'd get better feelings out of it. In fact, uh, I have ended up going changing the gearing on the impulse. I've gone to off-road spec tires, and with all of that, I realized every time I thought that I had hit the peak of what i could do with the motorcycle right that one change in gearing the one change with tires it all happened bit by bit hmm. it wasn't done at in one go right hmm. first i got the tires i used that i rode the bike on the stock tires for 6 7 years hmm. i used those tires consistently i didn't change there was later on with giri hmm. that uh, i went to uh, the pirellis hmm. and suddenly you realize my god you've not even like the bike still has so much to give you yeah. there's so much more you can do yeah. so it's a very capable off road motorcycle mm. on road it does feel uh yeah. unexciting but for but that's the problem right yeah. so in brazil where the bike originates from mm. they are used on road and off road because the road conditions vary and mm. it's a commuter in that sense is yeah. not really an yeah. off roader it has off road ability because some of your roads are off road and it was it was a fantastic i mean it is a fantastic yeah. commuter but when you downscale the engine mm. you lose the feel mm. and it happened uh, like the rd320 front brakes was the same thing yeah. every time you take one part of the motorcycle and scale it back for cost mm -hmm. you'll always have some sort of a disaster somewhere mm -hmm. the expulse feels so much better to ride than the impulse for one reason and one reason only it was mm -hmm. designed as a unit mm -hmm. that engine that frame that suspension together is the unit mm -hmm. you break the unit you lose the feel mm -hmm. right so uh, one dream or really mind blowing uh Oh. big big no no holds barred i would love to have the current one hmm i would love to i mean i have the latest ducati thankfully hmm. but to me the multi strada is a hmm. is like a global benchmark for me hmm. the first time we rode it was the uh, 2013 14 before hmm. the 2015 model was the update so before that hmm. it came straight from the port to the race track for us hmm. and it was unbelievable that a motorcycle that size and that looked like that would mm. do those things mm. my friend bharat reddy was there and we were complaining about how it was wallowing a little bit and bharat screams from the other side of the garage saying raise preload two clicks and you'll be fine mm. and we did that and that motorcycle was just transformed epic. so yeah. to me the idea that a motorcycle of this nature can do those things and they've kept it going to their credit right so even today it's a fantastic road bike it's great in the twisties it actually mm. works on the race track and mm. it goes off road mm. hardcore technical off road is now something the v4s is apparently capable of doing i'm not capable of doing so i mm. don't know but the fact that they are able to build that motorcycle out mm. and use it as their technology showcase even more than their sports bike today mm. which it outsells by i think 5 to 1 or something it i think it's an insane benchmark to set and i know on authority that none of the other big adv players in you know exactly who i'm talking about have unlocked that level of ability mm. a certain brand will gravitate towards a certain nature or feature and there's a brand that is much larger than ducati in that space that does that but even those engineers will quietly tell you off the record that what the multi strada seems to be able to unlock is unbelievable so this primarily to do with on road 
or the overall? the, the, the overall. fact that it does four things but it mm-hmm. does all four things with great competence okay it's very easy to say that especially look, with the v4 now yeah it's mm-hmm. very easy to say that this bike will do these three things well and mm-hmm. therefore this is a little bit of a compromise mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. they were able to eliminate the idea of the compromise mm-hmm. and you can individually see the brilliance of the execution of each four of those things mm-hmm. Mm. You know, wh- one of the things that Ducati <coughs> told me, and it and it's the reason why I don't think, for example, the TVS riding modes make any big difference, mm. is they said if you put riding modes too close to each other and Correct. they do more or less the same thing, why have them? Mm. Then it's just a gimmick. Correct. Right? So, uh, in the TVS's case, the problem is it's only got 21 bhp. How much difference can you possibly make? It's not a big envelope to make a big latitude in. But when you have 170 bhp, you get a big envelope so you can make big differences. But a lot of manufacturers don't. Right. So your selection of a certain ABS series of modes or a certain series of wheelie control modes or launch control modes, if they don't add up to a difference you can feel. So which is something they've nailed with the multi Yeah, because the four modes mm-hmm. in their stock setting, then you can play mm-hmm. with each of the settings, of mm-hmm. course. But each mode does change the motorcycle's behavior, nature, feeling, urgency mm-hmm. substantially. Okay, I'm going to cut you here because these are uh, own vehicles. So obviously we have spoken about them in the past. Yeah, yeah. Other than that... Um, I think the RSV4 sets a massive benchmark. Mm -hmm. I remember being at a Milan show ages and ages ago when the bike was first being launched and it was on a higher floor. And in my head it was because it's on a higher floor, it's probably not important. So I Mm. didn't go there till like the last moment. So I was literally on the way to the bus to go to the airport or something like that when I finally saw the RSV4 and I only remember seeing the narrow, the pinched uh, sharp tail. That's all I remember of seeing the RSV4 for the first time. And then the, and obviously the RSV meal had a great reputation by then. Hmm. So this was smaller, but I remember the sharp tail. So why is it a benchmark for you? I mean, why is it a milestone? It's remained the friendliest of the liter and liter plus sports bikes forever. Hmm. To the point where it today probably runs like the oldest unchanged frame, which for a liter class bike was sourced from a 250cc GP frame, right? It's, It's crazy. The idea is nuts. It's now that the bike is starting to lose out to newer competition. I don't think it is actually. It, it, it it's it's starting to like. I it's tell you why. The edge. I tell you why I don't believe those tests. Huh. The number of riders on earth who can unlock the ability and tell you that this bike is better or worse than the other one is, I think, five huh. in the world. Okay, if you're buying a two hundred plus bhp bike today, mm. just mm. go with your gut. Hmm. that's it that's all you need you don't need to know whether this is a sharper handler that has better tires handlebar position all of this is bs to try and get you to read a story and nothing else there is no way that you'll get anywhere close to that ability without years of work and on that count if you think about it the rsv4 is usually the easiest motorcycle to get on and have a good time with so i was actually going to get one one second if you think about the panigale it started out as a really difficult machine to ride but if you had that level of skill it was a rewarding machine to ride what do you think ducati has been doing ever since that panigale came out it was rewarding it was i don't think it was rewarding it was it felt satisfying from the standpoint that this is this wild beast and i'm managing to stay on top of it racers would tell you that it was rewarding to ride when you took it by the scruff of its neck and had the yeah, skill again, to do it. racers. Exactly. Racers. What have they done like since? Like you look at Valia riding it, you'll think it's the best machine no, on earth. What, have they, what has Ducati done since they then? They softened it. They have made the bike easier and yeah. easier and easier to ride. Yeah. What bike was easy to ride from day one? Exactly. The RSV4. Yeah. And that's why it's the benchmark. Uh, and, the, and it has remained a benchmark at uh, PD for uh, when I did the H2 and the RSV hmm. back to back. Hmm. H2 was the thing, right? Hmm. And I got onto the RSV and my God, immediately you will feel like I'm home. That's it. That's, I'm home. That's the key word. It's home. You don't have to put any effort. It's again, this motorcycle is 200 horsepower and it's telling you, come on, we can go. Hmm. We can go. It is like you always have the sense that the the wheels are absolutely tracking together. The bike is absolutely flat and it's got brute amount of power. It's no yeah. joke. But you... Feel control in control, and for me, that's I mean, Busa is one. The other bike I mm. wa- would want is yeah. It's I mean, to me, there's no doubt about it. Aprilia makes some of the world's best motorcycles, mm. and the RSV4 leads that from a, like a mile away. Mm. I, I I wish they'd get their act together in India and really do some work around it. But uh, so uh, quickly, I'm gonna go for one more, uh, and we've spoken about bikes, and uh, the one that I would want to talk about is BMW. Hmm. 
we think about luxury cars and automatically mercedes is sitting right up mm. up there and aspiration i get it mm. it's it's set the standard for what what, what world's best car right the mm. s class has been that flag bearer for so long you know it's a marketing term right mm. <laughs> so uh the 7 series has been one of the biggest surprises for me like you look at it and i'm talking the previous gen because the new gen which has just come to india i've not driven yet mm. and uh, when i did drive the 7 series i was so taken aback mm. that it looks very understated even the cabin mm. the design is so understated it's not flashy it's subdued but you get inside mm. and you start traveling in that mm. the sense of luxury just comes and wraps itself around you mm. the quietness of the cabin the way the suspension works mm. oh my god i cannot forget that and since then i have i have always looked at bmw's a little bit more closely mm. because that was like a bit of a tipping point for me until then the only other vehicle i used to like in the bmw lineup was the 3 gt mm. which i still think is a fantastic car mm. whoever has it good for you um the seven showed me that bmw was on to something mm. and i have i mean you can see it consistently in everything that they've built the designs have become more polarizing all of that not polarizing <laughs> it's yeah yeah get to it <laughs> no no it's not polarizing it's it's clearly the fact that people can't recognize bmw's anymore so the grill needs to get ever larger so that it can scream at you saying i am a bmw don't miss me <laughs> and on the other hand mercedes benz grills just look like more or less how they did and the three pointer star is enough <laughs> so yeah so bmw for me became a highlight mm-hmm. after the 7 uh there was a time i'm going to quickly jump to that the 3 series at one time was supposed to be the driver's car and bmw mm-hmm. dumbed down that steering to a point where i mean i did not enjoy it at all but people would be raving about it mm-hmm. i did not enjoy it but now the 7 and bmw's in general i think mm. are doing a fantastic job mm. so yeah in luxury it's the sense of luxury mm. everywhere i think it is uh, it is not so much about what's on paper it's about the things that you end up feeling like with the duke with the impulse it's the sense of whether it's confidence is a sense of luxury that the vehicles end up uh, mm. infusing you with yeah and if you're younger like me you don't think about luxury and all of this you just think about having fun <laughs> <laughs> and uh, i think we have a ton of fun vehicles Who in india who says that you can't have fun in a 7 series i didn't say you can't have fun in a 7 series but you didn't buy a 7 series to have fun in for that you have a porsche <laughs> swag <laughs> oh porsche is bit keeping out because we've spoken about them in the past but yeah, yeah it's there for to me if, if to me the benchmarks are about to me they are about fun Yeah. And I will write off a lot of practicality and all of this nonsense if the car mm. is or the bike is fun enough, and that's my benchmark. So when I recommend something to you, I'm always trying to imagine: Will you have fun with it? Mm. Okay, basic considerations like convenience mm. and service. Yes, but will you have fun with it? And if you won't mm. have fun with it, I'm reluctant to recommend it. Mm. No, obviously, I don't think that if it doesn't talk to you emotionally, uh, mm. it's difficult. I mean, even when we are talking about practical cars. I think that part of it where you want to spend time with it is critical mm. otherwise All right. We're going to close this up. This has been a long episode. What we'd like you to do is tell us in the comments vehicles that you think are your benchmarks. Mm. Okay? Uh I don't care if you want to take a mass market benchmark or a middle benchmark or a top benchmark it's a car motorcycle or a uh, it's just fine. Just tell us what you think are the benchmarks that you've experienced and they've changed the perception of how you think that class of vehicles should be. You know this conversation was supposed to be small because we actually whittled it down to <laughs> what we ridden and driven. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, let us know in the comments uh your benchmarks and the moment that you remember while riding or driving them. Thank you so much. Disconnect. <laughs>